button. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, this is John Morris uh, filling in for Jim Pfeifenberger. I work in the regional office for the Alaska region in, in interpretation. Uh, Jim Pfeifenberger, who normally hosts this webinar, uh, was un, uh, unable to attend today. He's got his daughter at the doctor's office in Seattle, so uh, he asked me to fill in in backup for him. So welcome all to the the regular, I guess it's almost a monthly now, uh, POET webinar. It's the Pacific Ocean Education Team, which is a group of folks from both the Pacific West and the Alaska region who are dedicating themselves to outreach and information about the uh, ocean issues. Uh, I'm here, I think Sarah Allen is online, maybe Bonnie Phillips is, on, is online too, uh, but I'm going to be uh, your facilitator for today. Uh, for those of you who are new to the webinar, uh, there's quite a few people that have logged in, so uh, the general practice is to make comments and ask questions via the chat box or question box, which is right there at the bottom of your control panel. So you can type your messages in there anytime. Uh, I'll be fielding those and uh, we'll, we'll feed them to our speaker uh, when his presentation concludes in, in a little bit. Uh, we do hold time at the end for Q&A, and uh, if there are more questions than there are, it's time to answer them. We can always uh, uh, continue the conversation a little beyond an hour. We should for 60 minutes, but uh, we also can answer questions off offline by email afterwards as well. So uh, with that, let me go ahead and uh, introduce today's speaker. It's uh, actually a returning speaker. I think Peter was with us uh, last year. Uh, he's a uh, from the North, uh, from the NOAA office for marine debris, is the Alaska Region Coordinator for Marine Debris, uh, and works uh, uh, for NOAA. And uh, Peter is uh, going to talk to us today about give us an update on how the North Pacific Marine Debris is doing for 2013. So welcome, Peter. Take it away. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Um, so as um, as was introduced, I am the Alaska Coordinator for the Mill Marine Debris Program. I work out of the Seattle office, um, but um, I work primarily on Alaska issues, um, but also um, work on um, overall modeling and detection issues um, for the Marine Debris Program in general. So today I'm going to be talking primarily about the tsunami marine debris um, and the general issue just based on the ongoing interest with it. But please do keep in mind that a lot of what we're talking about here um, really does apply. A lot of the, the efforts that are being done um, for that have been targeted at tsunami marine debris or understanding that issue really do have overlap with um, the general marine debris issue um, overall. So, um, and I'll reinforce that as we go through here. So, just briefly, um, a quick background uh, or a quick outline of what we're going to talk through. So, we'll talk about background on um, tsunami marine debris issue, um, kind of the origin of it. That'll be a review for a lot of you, um, but also maybe helpful for those who um, have are coming to the issue um, newer, um, actions to date, things that have been going on, and then things that are ongoing, so um, things that are continuing. Um, a lot of those are things that you, many of you on the call have been and hopefully will continue to be engaged in and um, participating in, so we're very grateful for all that assistance, um, which is a thread we'll continue to this, this talk. So first, a little bit about the NOAA Marine Debris Program, just you know um, where we're kind of coming to the issue from and, and kind of our responsibilities and approach. So um, we're a relatively young program we were established just in 2005 um, and as a result of the Marine Debris Research Prevention and Reduction Act of December 2006. Um, so, you know, while that act of Congress certainly sometimes acts don't necessarily have a the name of the act doesn't really tell you a lot about what the act does. In this case, it actually does a pretty good job of explaining what our overall mission is. Um, so part of it is in doing research to identify the um, impacts and better understand the impacts of marine debris in the environment, um, and then also doing reductions, actually going out into the environment, removing debris, so supporting through grants, um, removal efforts at community-based um, levels, actually go out and remove marine debris from shorelines or from the benthic environment or other places, and then taking those together, so you know, research on what the impacts are, you know, how bad is this debris when it's out there, and then the reduction, which helps us get a sense of how much of that is there, so you know, if you do research on how on the impact of a crab pot in a given environment, then you go and remove a certain amount of crab pots from a given area. You can sort of put that together to for a prevention message that says, you know, here's what the crab pots are doing in this area. So as an example of that, that's work that we've done in Southeast Alaska, Puget Sound, and other parts of the country is work on um, derelict crab pots. So that's or um, fish traps. So that sort of work is an example of tying that together. Um, we are regionally structured, so um, just as I mentioned earlier, so I'm the regional coordinator for Alaska. Um, 
and so, but we also have regional coordinators for um, the Northwest, California, um, East Coast, Southeast, Gulf of Mexico, and um, Pacific Islands. So um, we have do a regional focus, but we're headquartered in DC as many groups are. So um, moving on from there to talk about specific tsunami marine debris event. Um, so again, this may be a review for many of you, but the marine debris event um, on March 11, 2011 was triggered by a 9.0 magnitude earthquake, um, which created a wave that reached over 120 feet high at its highest point. Um, here you can see at top right um, an image of the ocean energy distribution that came from that event and just how much energy was dispersed over the Pacific Ocean. And then at the lower right you can see obviously that energy, the direct impact um, in Japan. Um, and at the lower left, obviously, again, the devastation afterwards. So it inundated over 217 square miles. Um, for those of you in Alaska, I did kind of the math, and that equates to between 15 and 20 percent of the combined city and borough of Anchorage. So um, quite, a, quite a large area um, as an example, but certainly that's large no matter what it's compared to. Um, it also obviously was a, a human tragedy, first and foremost. You know, while we're, we're talking about as a marine debris event, um, it began and continues to be a human tragedy where almost, almost 16,000 people lost their lives definitively and another 3,500 are missing and presumed dead. Um, but so as the waves came ashore, certainly it caused devastation on land. And you can see it lower left, it you know, brought marine infrastructure ashore, but then also as it retreated, it brought significant amounts of debris back into the water. So um, what you can see in this next slide, just one moment, a little bit of trouble here. There we go. Um, the type of debris that was drawn offshore was as diverse as the areas that it impacted, which were very diversely populated and diversely developed. Um, so this image at lower right taken by the U.S. Navy just uh, two days after the tsunami, you can see kind of what we're talking about when we say tsunami debris. And as we'll get into later, a lot of these are the type of things that have now shown up on shore. Um, you see an overturned vessel, um, roofs of houses, um, black buoys, uh, styrofoam buoys. Um, but then also, if you could zoom in on this image significantly more, you would see a lot of household goods, so um, small floatables, plastic containers, that sort of thing. And so really, it goes to show just how diverse um, the debris was. I mean, here, obviously, there's a lot of woody debris, um, which we'll talk about more a little bit later. So one of the questions immediately afterwards and since has been, well, you know, can we see this debris? How do we find this debris out in the open ocean? So this imagery here, which many of you may have already seen, shows you know that at left uh, an image of the marine debris from a slightly higher altitude right after the tsunami. But then at right also you see um, the satellite imagery um, at roughly 15 to 30 meter resolution showing that same those same bands or um, fields of debris. So in the image at right, um, in each individual pixel is roughly um, 15 to 30 meters in size. So that shows you just how big these areas are. They were miles long. But that only persisted for a matter of weeks after the tsunami. The debris spread out and spread out over a wide area. What you can see when you look at these at sea sightings reported from the Japanese Coast Guard immediately after the tsunami um, in October, November of 2011, so between five and six months later, um, you see the different types of debris. So you see fishing boat, capsized boat, similar things that were seen earlier. But if you'll notice, in each of these images, it's only individual objects. Um, there's not a field of debris around these objects. The fishing boat's on its own. The fishing gear, while it's aggregated together and probably tied together, it's not in a, uh, it's not in a, a clump of debris, which really shows how much the debris spread out um, over space and time. So from there, the question became, where will the debris go and when will it get there? Um, which really results in something that many of you probably heard or talked through yourselves and or have direct experience with of the question of ocean currents combined with winds really gets you to where something um, has a chance of ending up. Certainly when you're talking about the time scales and distances that we're talking about here, um, you know, in thousands of miles and, and years in terms of time, um, there's, obvious, there's certainly un, there are uncertainties that come with that. But generally, um, you know, an object's movement being a combination of its of the ocean currents that it's acted upon based on where it is, 
combined with how it sits in the water, so what's its windage or its sail effect area. Um, the Coast Guard calls, calls it leeway. But effectively, something that's lower in the water is going to move not only more slowly, but also in a different direction since it's influenced primarily by currents, rather than something that sits high in the water um, that you would see moving in a different direction and at different speeds. So this output that you see in front of you is actually the result of um, those current the modeling approach that takes into account um, estimations of um, objects that do have windage. So in this case, this is a, an, it's a hindcast, um, and at the top left you can see the actual hindcast output that's on the Marine Debris Program website um, that's updated on a monthly basis. But in the background you can see um, what it shows, um, specifically for the most recent run, um, as of uh, February 5th, it's actually uh, even more recent, but this is the most recent for this slide, um, showing uh, the area. But basically, what you see here is that this outlined dotted area um, contains 95% of all the simulated particles. When we say simulated particles, what we mean is that in this model, we took 8,000 individual simulated marine objects and put them in the water at eight locations off the shore of. Um, Japan, where the wave height was estimated to be or recorded to be greater than three and a half meters. And then this runs from the time of the tsunami until the present time or the time of the run. So in this case, February 5th. Reason being that that actually allows it to use measured winds and currents for that period of time. So rather than projecting, we're able to use um, hindcast data um, to, or were you able to use weather and currents that are actual or observed rather than trying to project. Because again, as we talked about over this time scale and this distance scale, projecting or forecasting winds or currents into the future is very difficult. Um, so even you know, most winds and current data only forecast about 72 hours in the future. And beyond that, you need to start using long-term averages. So what you see here, the result of it is this dotted area outlines the total of where um, debris would be or the potential for all of the particles, all different winds, just everything from something that flows very high and moves very quickly, um, all the way down to something that's um, much heavier and moves more slowly. But the stippled area, where the yellow area shows the area with the highest concentration of low wind debris items, that would be things like lumber or um, even slower moving objects like line, net, those sort of things. Although some of those objects may have weathered to the point of no longer being persistent. They may not. They may no longer be out there, which is a question that is ongoing. In, co in combination with this, something else that's been um, has been an ongoing step is tracking sightings. So, NOAA has established a sightings website or sightings account, disasterdebris at NOAA.gov, where people can email in what they've seen. Um, so obviously they, have, they think have a potential connection to the tsunami. So this map represents those sightings, yellow or potential debris sightings. So obviously we couldn't confirm whether they came from the tsunami or not. Red triangles represent confirmed debris sightings. So objects that we could definitively trace back to an origin um, in the impact area, um, working with Japanese consulates or media to really get that confirmation. In those cases, um, that, those confirmations have really been based around typically a, uh, a fingerprint, um, an object that really has a unique identifier, whether that's a boat, the registration, or that you see the soccer ball there on Middleton Island in the Gulf of Alaska. It was based on actual personal inscription. Uh, again, a poignant reminder of the origin of this event. But it brings to, what this kind of brings together, though, is overall the difficulty in fingerprinting any piece of debris, whether it's during a tsunami debris response or in general, back to its origin. It's very hard to tell where something came from. Uh, we've worked with several different projects that have worked with net identification based on patterns and assembly, but um, it's very difficult because you might be able to get back to the manufacturer, but then how do you know whether where it was actually used? Um, you know, crab pot buoys sometimes have, they, you know, depending on the regulations and states, they can have some very good data that will be able to lead you to the fishermen. Um, but you know, if they've moved significantly, then it can be challenging to figure out where they were actually lost. And this has been an example of that. Uh, as a direct example, you can see is um, these two black buoys. Um, the one at the top was reported on Hinchinbrook Island in Gulf, in, uh, Gulf of Alaska. Um, 
you know, sometime during during the uh, kind of 2011, 2012 winter to spring time frame, um, or that was when it was reported it was in the spring, but it had decided it had come ashore before then. But that object fits the profile of a debris object that is floating that high that could have made it across the Pacific in that amount of time. So hard to tell, but it could be from the tsunami, and it fits the profile. But the object at right, that oyster buoy, um, we've had we had reports of those before and after the tsunami. So um, it's challenging that some of these objects, while we've seen spikes in the concentration of high floating debris, such as buoys, such as styrofoam, that would indicate that a lot of these high floating debris objects could very well be from the tsunami, but on an individual object by object basis, it's very difficult to confirm exactly where they came from. Um, so to help with that, um, one of the things we're doing is doing monitoring programs, which we'll talk more about in just a minute. But to give it an example of this sightings um, data and how it, it really shows how things spread out over the ocean, um, these are the, the docks um, that many of you are aware of. Um, three docks that were washed away from the port of Misawa um, in the northern part of, the, of Japan um, during the tsunami. And it, I should note that there, we have been confirmed that there were three docks that were washed to sea. Um, there was a fourth dock in the port, but um, it was that stayed in the port but washed ashore there. So those three docks are washed to sea from the same location. You can see at top right an image of what they look like in situ originally. Um, but they left from the same place at the same time, roughly the same design, or the same design, roughly the same condition. But they ended up in three very different places. So in June 2012, the first dock washed ashore in Oregon. It's September 2012, uh, second dock, which, based on the reports, is the profile of being one of these three solid docks. Um, narrowly missed the Hawaiian Islands, uh, the main eight, but has not been sighted or come ashore. And then in December 2012, the third dock came ashore in Washington State. So three objects left the same place at the same time, coming ashore and very being sighted in very different places at different times. Really shows just the diversity of uh, how much these objects can be acted upon by currents and winds. It's really spread out over a really wide area. Um, as another example, and perhaps maybe you've heard of this, that um, one of those docks, if, if the kind of good example, detection challenges for these, is that one of these docks would be very, is obviously a very small target in the open ocean. Um, in fact, you would take the North Pacific Ocean and shrink it to the size of a football field. Um, one dock would be roughly the same width as a human hair standing on end on that football field. So that goes to show just the size of the area that we're talking about um, as a target area for detection. So detection is one of the key pieces of scientific support though that NOAA has been working to provide through this. So we already talked about modeling, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of these other elements. So satellite detection, um, use of unmanned aircraft systems for detection, shoreline monitoring, We've already talked a bit about the sightings, report tracking, data collection, and then also um, the alien species component, which is certainly an area of interest and concern. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So some of the ongoing actions um, really do fit into these categories. Um, detection, one of the key things with that is that we've been working both to do targeted and opportunistic detection activities. So targeted, meaning working with satellite and other technology to actually go out and look for debris in a specific area. Opportunistic meaning working with um, mariners, aviators, other groups, so that when they're out, they actually can report in what they see. Since certainly with um, with this overall marine debris issue and the, the, the vast target area, it's very important that we're getting opportunistic sightings um, since there's just limits of how much the ocean we can look at with, um, with technology. Um, and certainly also that with weather, weather issues and um, other challenges, having really eyes on the ground and educated eyes of mariners who really know what's normal and what to see um, is, is certainly important. Um, we've already talked about modeling, but then the monitoring piece, planning preparedness, and communicating the outputs of all of these are really important aspects of what we're trying to do. And when I say we, and I'll mention this later, but really, the we in this case is the active marine debris community. Certainly, you know, you're hearing a presentation of the NOAA Marine Debris Program, but in no way is the NOAA Marine Debris Program the only actors in this. As a matter of fact, we're one of many, many very, uh, very engaged agencies at the federal level, the state level, local, and NGOs, 
um, really has been a very much a collaborative team effort um, and it's been absolutely necessary because without that, those inputs, we wouldn't have nearly the picture um, as a community of, of what's been going on um, throughout the in Pacific area. So one area of collaboration has been um, satellite detection. As I mentioned earlier, the first efforts were tracking debris fields right after the event. But since then, we've been working with um, NOAA, National Environmental Satellite Data Information Service, or NESTIS, um, to actually request and receive um, uh, data from the NGA, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, so we've received great partnership from them. And you can see it right. These actually show the areas where we requested and received satellite data. Um, you can kind of see the, the brown polygons and then moving over to that to the blue polygon there, showing that as over time we, we, we move those request areas to follow um, what was believed to be the path of debris over time using the modeling data that we were developing. Since then, what you can see is those circles. We've actually shifted to a long-term target area approach where we're collecting, working to collect data in the same areas on a relatively uh, frequent basis. As data is available, we can get the requests in, and obviously as cloud cover allows, um, since the sensors that are best for detecting marine debris are visual or multispectral imagery, which is, a, is affected by clouds. But the idea is to understand both um, to try to detect debris in those areas, but also to build a contextual knowledge in those areas so that um, we have a better sense of what typically exists in those areas whether there's a lot of fishing traffic, shipping traffic, um, so that we can potentially exclude that um, from debris sightings as, as possible. Um, those, those, the satellite data so far hasn't shown um, debris. And we have, we're still working with, there's been a lot of great work with, on the analysis of, of that satellite data. Um, but what it has shown that's been very helpful is it's confirmed that debris is spread out. There haven't been any sightings of aggregations or um, fields of debris, um, so that fits right along. Another detect targeted detection effort has been um, using unmanned aircraft systems, UAS. I know it's a, certainly a, a topic of significant interest in, at a lot of levels at the moment. Um, so we're in the testing phase. That image you see actually is a, of a test that we conducted off of Hawaii, um, putting some sample debris in the water with the concept of seeing if we could see it um, both from a UAS but also from satellite data. And so we're building off of that to conduct operations um, in the Gulf of Alaska off of Manila Ship Fairweather uh, in 2013 so during this coming field season. Um, so to work on both uh, testing the technology and also seeing what debris we can find and what we, run, and what we see um, out, in the, out in the open Gulf of Alaska. In the near term, um, there's also a UAS testing or UAS, a planned UAS operation um, looking at seabird counts or um, testing their ability to work within that environment or that project on the Olympic coast um, coming up in June and we're working to build in marine debris section at an opportunistic basis so basically you know, seeing what they can see as part of or in addition to um, the seabird surveys during that effort. Again that points to just the fact that um, with the you know, marine debris certainly is an issue that can impact a lot of different resources and so it's very important um, given you know, the and limitations on resources um, and on the funding side uh, and on manpower and everything else to use as many opportunistic approaches as we can to get data, um, especially in more remote areas like uh, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, Alaska, uh, remote Alaska shoreline, and the open Pacific in general. Another example of um, detection efforts is rapid detection requests. Um, this is something that we've put into place where we actually have the ability to request satellite data on a short turnaround. So um, between 24 and 72 hours after the request, we can actually get satellite data back. Um, typically for non-national uh, security issues, it's requesting satellite data is somewhat of a longer process. Um, but in this case, when we receive um, a report of a large object that potentially has a human health and safety impact um, or risk, we can actually request that data on a short-term basis, um, usually building off of um, short-term trajectory modeling of where that object might be going to. So we've implemented this several times, um, looking for really smaller or um, more, uh, more salient objects. 
another example of detection efforts, this is something that you can find actually online at the uh, NOAA IRMA website as well as the Alaska Department of Environmental Confers Confer Conservation website, apologies, um, is shoreline surveys. Um, so both opportunistic by aircraft that just go out, private pilots are looking at the shoreline, um, can report in what they see. But in this case, what you're seeing is a targeted shoreline survey um, from Dixon Entrance in southeast Alaska all the way around um, through to the Kodiak Archipelago. And in this case, as you see the color-coded results, basically there were 8,000 images that resulted from the survey. And those images were rated on a qualitative scale of 0 to 5 for debris density. And then that was converted into um, this graphic that you see here um, based on those, it was color-coded based on those ratings. Um, and this was used and is being used um, in a prioritization effort um, to actually look at the shorelines in Alaska um, to see what, what can be done um, with the, in 2013, where, where to extend um, resources out there are available. Hand-in-hand -hand with that sh um, shoreline debris detection by satellite or, or rather by aircraft is also monitoring efforts. Um, so one of the things that the tsunami debris issue has um, given the opportunity for is uh, a lot of collaboration with agencies, including National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, and others um, to look at uh, putting in place standardized protocol. Um, for shoreline monitoring, so collecting data on uh, what's coming ashore, both by composition, what, and also by quantity, how much. Because um, changes in those trends can really be, provide a clue um, to the arrival of tsunami debris um, and the amount of tsunami debris that we're seeing. Because certainly, while we can't uh, identify an individual object, so it may be tough to say whether an individual water bottle or an individual styrofoam buoy is from Japan. If we know that typically you know, X number of styrofoam buoys come ashore, but now we're seeing Y number, which is much greater, that can be a clue when combined with modeling that, that shows that, yeah, that, that's the profile of the type of debris we'd be seeing. Um, and that is what we've seen um, with shoreline monitoring results initially um, in, in Alaska. It was a significant increase in those light floatables, including foam. Um, so here you see a map of all those sites. Um, those are over 81 active sites in the Pacific. Um, there's actually even more than that, but it's a mixture of sites that are um, collected on a regular basis and sites that are more on a snapshot basis, um, so individual point in time sampling um, when the partner could actually get out to a remote site. Um, so we're working to enter those into an online database that's been created for it um, and then to analyze that data to get a better sense of what we're seeing and hoping to continue that into this coming year, which is um, something that we, we really are uh, really grateful to all the partners that have taken that on and um, made this uh, protocol part of their work since it really does help paint a, a very important and overall picture of the marine debris issue in the Pacific. Um, another effort that um, and this slide is a little bit focused on Alaska just because that's where I've done I've been working primarily but um, is planning and prioritization so um, certainly and for preparing. So looking at um, preparing for the potential arrival of debris and doing that at a regional basis since um, each state, um, while federal agencies have land and land management responsibilities, each state has its own different uh, different land uh, management and different agencies that handle things differently. So um, these, these processes are inclusive, so they include federal, state, and native inputs, um, as well as locals and NGOs. Um, but they're being done at a state by state. So you can see sh shots at right of the state of Oregon JTMD plan, the state of Washington JTMD plan, and then in Alaska, as I mentioned, um, it's taken the form of working on a federal framework. Um, so collecting the different actions and um, capabilities and responsibilities of the federal agencies that own or manage land, um, but then also taking that and building on that into an actual prioritization based on what we see, what we seem to come ashore um, to inform uh, where we can focus efforts. Since um, an important point of this entire tsunami debris issue is that um, tsunami debris added to an existing problem. It's not something new. And so it's important that um, in any given year we keep in mind that um, there's, there's frequently more need for marine debris.
every action and our resources to, to do that work. And so it's important to prioritize. So well, one of the last bits that I want to talk about is the concept of communications and outreach that, you know, really all this work is, you know, great and we're getting a lot of valuable data, but it's very important to be communicating what's being found out to the public. And um, I, yeah, again, I'll mention the, the, our appreciation for all the partners and all they're doing um, to support that. Um, but that can be through traditional media, um, but we have that's printed media, posters, um, working with partners to identify things, um, but also social and digital media. Uh, that's a big part of it. And then also meetings, briefings, public presentations, um, and those sort of uh, direct interactions. So you can see here examples of the website, one pager, and also an infographic um, that we put together that show kind of the overall big picture of the issue. So kind of bringing it together here, kind of a, a summary of what we know. For those of you who heard a presentation before, you may recognize this slide. Um, but first of all, as I mentioned earlier, tsunami debris added to an existing problem of marine debris um, that certainly was impacting shorelines, you know, different lands and intensive areas um, years previous and will continue to in, in years to come. Um, so that's an important point we want to reinforce that um, tsunami debris didn't start this marine debris issue, it added to it. Um, it's likely much that much of the debris sank near shore off the Japanese coast. Um, debris is dispersed and not in large concentrations or fields. Um, that's something we've continued to see. Um, of the sightings, again, uh, to date there's been 23 sightings of confirmed JTMB. Actually, there's its 23rd confirmation today. Um, but that's absolutely as many more unconfirmed. Um, and the presence of those confirmed items means that JTMB has certainly arrived. Uh, the obvious state, you know, presence of a, a soccer ball in Middleton says that objects of that profile could be Japan tsunami debris throughout that area. But it's stuff to individually fingerprint an object back to its origin. Uh, but what we have noted is an increase in styrofoam, buoys, and high floating debris um, during the 2012 to 2013 uh, field season, just overall season. So we're looking into 2013, expecting to see um, generally potentially fewer of those high floating objects, since many of them are beached, potentially more lower floating objects, which fits with what we're seeing now. Um, although certainly there could be continued uh, instances of those high floating objects, both um, that are left out in the open ocean, but also that are refloated from, from beaches elsewhere and continue to move along. So you know, that's kind of an overall update on, on what's being done and what's being seen. But an important point, too, is Really, this is an ongoing opportunity for engagement um, with folks. We really appreciate the engagement so far with a lot of different agencies. Um, so first is those opportunities are, are feedback and input. So are there local questions that you are getting from um, your constituency that you would want to see answers to? And what information do you need to provide to those people? Um, we certainly welcome that feedback. Um, outreach and education goes right along with that. And then also working to join in with monitoring programs. So um, if there are monitoring efforts or data collection efforts in your region that you're aware of, um, building in marine debris uh, protocols would certainly be um, a great help um, and something that we would love to talk more about. And then you know, being a local POC for sightings, so letting people know that they can, they can report in sightings through that disaster at account, and then overall just staying informed on the issue. So with that, um, thank you. These are just a very brief list of non Non, uh, non complete, non exhaustive list of the, all the many other folks, many groups that have been uh, critical of this effort. Uh, you know, it's been a team effort throughout. Um, but with that, I wanted to open it up for a, just a couple of questions. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, is that fascinating? Uh, so, this is your opportunity now to ask questions or, or file comments. And uh, we have about 50 folks on the line. So, the best thing to do is to type those comments into the chat box. And I'll field them for Peter, and you can ask them directly. Uh, Peter, you can go ahead and leave your contact information up on the screen so folks have that as reference if they need it. And, uh, and I'll open up the door for questions. And I actually have a question for you myself just to get things rolling. Um, what is done with the debris? Which, I mean, you cite it, you detect it, you figure out where it came from. Uh, is, it, is there any special handling, taking, dealing, dealing with it once you've found it and identified it and 
categorized it all? That's a good question. Um, I mean, tsunami marine debris generally, I mean, barring its origin, is you know part of the existing marine debris problem. So it's really about um, finding the best local disposal for it. So whether that's recycling, whether in some cases that's reuse. Um, we've actually had people reuse some of the buoys that have come ashore, um, but it can really depend on on the local um, region and what you know what what people can use can use it for. Uh, but generally, just the most proper disposal uh, method is, is what's what's going to be the next step for most debris, hopefully. Thanks. Uh, here's a question from Don Stenko, and he actually Don posted some additional information about the Poet Group uh, earlier in the chat box too. You can take a look at. Great. Uh, but Don's question is: uh, Are there any updated plans to redo the coastal aerial survey flights? I'm sorry to to what? To redo uh, coastal aerial survey flights. Oh, good question. Um, so in Alaska, um, there is, at our prioritization workshop, we actually had a workshop to talk through um, the shoreline prioritization for the 2013 field season based on that aerial survey data. There was kind of, there was a lot of interest from folks in redoing those shoreline surveys, um, but trying to work on how that could be done, either if there's funding available to do it um, or if it can be done opportunistically, so as part of other aerial surveys, they can collect other photographic data that would be comparable. So short answer is there's not a direct plan to redo that entire thing, but we're hoping um, that there will be a chance to at least get some spot data to ground truth and see, and see what's changed. Okay, very good. Here's a question from Beverly Schoonover. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a one. There's one million dollars for tsunami debris work in Alaska through the Department of Environmental Conservation proposed budget. Uh, do you know where is the money going and where uh, will it be regranted? Yeah, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I've heard you know, as she mentioned that you know there's uh, it seems to be referring to state of Alaska funding for Department right. of Environmental Conservation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that um, in working with them that. We would hope that we'd be able to use that prioritization effort based on what was identified, um, you know, and where the highest concentrations are, um, taking into account also impact and obviously the logistics of getting to these areas. Um, but that's going to be something that you know, ADEC will will certainly be, be looking at, figuring out where to put it, where where's going to be the best bank for the buck, I would imagine. It may actually be a, a, a redirect for the next question. Rick Rowland asked, "Where can the Sunak tribe of?" The Kodiak apply for grant funding to participate in monitoring portion of the program. Is there any no grants? So if so, if you want to, if I would encourage folks that are interested in monitoring to reach out and um, let us know. Um, typically, we've, we've we've been able to give out some limited funding just to support kind of the you know the, some of the equipment needs um, and that sort of thing. But most of the monitoring has been done um, by folks kind of as interested. Um, there's not a specific grant application, you know, a grant program for the um, for the monitoring itself. Um, but we certainly welcome anybody who's interested. We'd love to talk further and, and see how we might be able to pull something off. Okay, and a question from Lewis Sherman asking, uh, for outreach purposes, is there such a thing as a gallery of images or other descriptions of the JTMD objects likely to be found on the Alaska exposed coastline? Between Cape Spencer and Icy Bay, it's one thing that appears to be missing. Gotcha. So, was the question specifically for Cape between that and that area, Cape Spencer and Icy Bay? Yeah, I think Lewis is particularly interested in that particular area. Yeah. Gotcha. No. So, there's not at the moment. That's a good point. There isn't a um, there isn't a specific gallery of, of objects. Although um, you can on our website and look and find um, images of. Um, Debris that has been reported. You can also, through that Irma website that I posted earlier, um, you can find all of the aerial images. Those are all available online um, of that of the aerial survey. So you can actually look at those images too. Um, but that's a really good point about providing sort of gallery work. Hoping to work with this, uh, we are working with the state and hoping to come out with um, uh, some additional some additional products on that. It's always a challenge of coordinating such a such a thing. Um, Another question from Peter Neatlich. Uh Is NOAA actively gathering trend data on microplastic debris in the marine water column? And if so, where? Good question. Um, 
so microplastics is an ongoing area of research. Um, there's, it's not part of this same shoreline monitoring effort um, that we're talking about here, or at least it's not the same specific target. But we have done work um, on um, developing protocols um, for identification of microplastics, um, both in substrate, like you know, sandy particles um, or you know, sandy beach, that sort of thing, but also in the water column. Um, so there has been some work on it, but that work isn't, isn't built into the same monitoring approach. Uh, another question, Benoit Perrin, I didn't think is the name. Uh, in the framework of debris monitoring reporting, you might want to consider Ocean Network so Canada's Coast Buster. It's an app for a smartphone available for iPhone and Android platforms. And he's got a, 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 a web address here that I'll, I'll pass along. Are you familiar oh, yeah, with other apps or much. Actually, devices? So, so we've, yeah, so we've actually reached out to, or the Coast Buster folks have reached out to us, and um, there, there's been conversations about um, them passing on what they get through that app into the disaster debris account where appropriate for potential tsunami debris. Um, you know, we can't know for sure that, that's, that all the connections are, are built there, um, but we have been in communication with those folks. They've been, they've been great. Seems like it'd be possible to take advantage of some of the wire, wire at least the online connectivity in some of the coastal areas where that might occur. Mm -hmm. uh, question from Kate McLaughlin. Uh, are incidences, incidences of hazardous materials being found in, in a suspected de debris from Japan, or is most of it inert by the time it hits U.S. shores? Good question. Um, certainly within marine debris in general, you can have isolated instances of hazardous materials or potential hazardous materials. Obviously, you know, a household container, if you don't know what's, if there's no labeling on it, it's something you've got to be careful with, you know, could contain something that's, um, you know, that you don't want to be messing with. Um, but there hasn't been any, there hasn't, there hasn't been a noted um, difference in, you know, the force, what might be tsunami to reuse, uh, has more ha hazardous component to it than um, what is part of uh, the normal debris. Um, background issue. We are working closely with the states on notification uh, protocols so that um, people that are out on the beaches can actually know who to contact in the states, um, both about potential tsunami debris, but also about debris that has, you know, that either is unknown um, or, you know, looks like it might have something hazardous component to it. Um, reactivity is something that people have asked about. And, you know, the consensus has been um, universal that you know, it's not highly, highly, highly unlikely, and um, all the states have done spot checks um, on debris that is washed ashore and haven't found any elevated levels above background. So that's not something that uh, is a concern, but there's continuing to be spot checks to make sure that that's correct. Uh, very good. And a question from Susan Perkins. Is NOAA using or interested in information on marine debris that lands on the British Columbia coast? Canada? Yes, actually. So um, the disaster debris at NOAA.gov account, we actually receive sightings. And we've worked with the Canadian government um, so that they're using, they're, they're sending out that information. So we receive sightings um, to that account from British Columbia citizens, and then we pass that on to the government in BC, both the provincial and then um, they work closely with their federal government. That's a really good question. So the, well, we're waiting for any other questions to come in. The, 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 the airwaves are open for more questions. Uh, I just was wondering whether there's a seasonality to the debris showing up. Does, does it tie into storm activity and, and, or times of the year when you're more likely to, to show activities? And you know, are there cleanup events and things like that that are occurring that could target outreach events, outreach? That's a really good question. Um, so. Generally, um, you know, during the winter, the, the winter and spring months, um, actually fall, winter and spring months, you know, you start to get into those storm patterns that tend to drive more debris ashore, especially in um, Alaska and British Columbia. Um, but, and then in the summer months, you know, the, there's more of an upwelling, you get some oceanography of it, but you, you do see, tend to see less debris coming ashore. It doesn't mean there's not any, um, but that you see less debris coming ashore in terms of, you know, just frequency. Um, but at the same time, the flip side of that is you can also see reef load. So debris that washes ashore, for example, on Kruzov or down uh, in the southeast can reef load and then make its way up to Kayak Island, for example, that sort of thing. 
Um, that's you know, Alaska-based kind of examples. But there are marine debris cleanup efforts throughout the year, um, generally more during starting in the spring uh, with Earth Day and other events, especially in Alaska with the field season. Um, so there are a lot of great opportunities for outreach and community involvement. So looking for people to you know, go out and do cleanup on their own or as part of a volunteer organization, it's always great. So here's another question kind of on that, on the, on the accumulation. Uh, this one from Fritz Klassner about the, uh, how do you differentiate interannual variability in debris accumulation rates associated with the predominant winter wind patterns from increases due to the tsunami debris? So is it is it all the debris from the tsunami or is it uh, just the changes in the amount of wind activity? That's a really good question. And that's part of the reason um, to, this establishing establishing monitoring programs, but also in some cases building off of existing monitoring programs where there is a baseline data is has been really helpful and will continue to be important because you know, in some cases it's very difficult to distinguish interannual variability from tsunami debris variability. But in the cases um, where we do have longer term data sets, um, the spikes have been notable for certain types of debris, specifically the the light floatables, um, so uh, styrofoam, light plastics, buoys, that sort of thing, that really do distinguish it from previous interannual variability. Um, but some of those data sets certainly have also had, you know, been taken at less frequent intervals. Um, so, you know, it can't certainly capture all of that to distinguish it, um, but it does show a significant spike. So, and this is kind of a question about the prediction of uh, debris as well, and uh, you've kind of referred to this a little bit, but I'll throw it out there uh, as well. It's from Tim Shepard. Is, is there data that can be used to create a prediction of a shoreline that it has a high probability of concentration of debris? And they're just particularly targeting where it might fall. Well, there's certainly, um, there's a few ways to approach that, and uh, not an exhaustive list, but, um, by looking at previous trends in debris deposition, so you know, as I mentioned, tsunami debris, while its origin may be different, you know, its its general behavior is similar once it's out in the open ocean into debris of similar composition. So, looking at you know where debris tends to aggregate or beaches that tend to be catcher beaches that receive a lot of debris, those tend to be areas that over time receive not just you know, they receive general marine debris and tsunami debris as well. So um, that's something that can be predictive or at least, you know, not so predictive quantitatively, but at least qualitatively that this is an area that would receive more debris based on previous experience. Um, in the longer, you know, in a more specific sense or uh, quantitative sense, um, you know, there are sources for longer term forecasts of, you know, Climatological data, but really those are based on long term averages of weather and currents. And so using those to model debris movement, you get a lot of inherent uncertainty. In, there's uncertainty built into those based on both the uncertainty of the weather forecast itself, as we all have experienced with weather forecasts, but also um, that the resolution is tough for near shore. Um, and that they don't really resolve to a beach by beach level. You can sort of get a better sense of which state might get more or which region, but not necessarily um, you know, beach by beach, which is really where the, the previous experience of monitoring data and you know on the ground experience of people really comes to comes to fore. Excellent, excellent. Uh, got time, got time for a couple more questions. questions. I've got one here from uh, Richard Erickson asking, is NOAA, is NOAA or, or, or who is involved in monitoring the radiation in the water, in the water from Japan and Japan, and it goes into the Pacific Ocean? ocean. You mentioned, you mentioned that. It's not I'm sorry, um, you're kind of breaking up a bit. Could you could you repeat that question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, the question, the question is from Richard Erickson asking, is NOAA, is NOAA involved, involved in monitoring radiation, radiation in the water, water from Japan that goes into, goes into the Pacific Ocean, Ocean or who is doing that monitoring? Okay, um, sorry. I, it was still breaking up a bit, but what I got was that it's a question of whether NOAA is involved in monitoring radiation in the ocean. Um, and then after that, I lost it, but I'll try to answer that part. So. Um, NOAA doesn't directly, at least the Marine Reef Program, doesn't do direct monitoring of radiation. Um, but we do, we have been since the event um, working closely with agencies that have been doing um, radiation research 
based on not necessarily the marine debris component, but on the water based on oceanographic research. Um, so that includes the, the International Atomic Energy Association working with the Japanese that they set up um, radiation um, perimeter around the Fukushima site um, offshore. And as well, there was a study by Woods Hole um, Oceanographic Institute that actually went out in the open Pacific. Um, and the data points for that do show that the water that was, uh, the water column, the water samples that they tested, uh, as soon as uh, a month, um, six weeks to eight weeks after the tsunami event, the water even 35 kilometers offshore of the Fukushima uh, reactor site uh, passed drinking water tests for radiation. Now, obviously, it's seawater, so there's other complications so you wouldn't like drinking it, but um, it does show the radiation dispersion uh, over such a wide area in, in, the, in the ocean um, really did spread it out. Um, and the Woods Hole data from further offshore um, showed, showed um, also you know, that all the radiation levels were well below any level of impact or concern. Oh, good. We have one uh, one more question here. It says from Rick Rowland and asking, uh, what is the plan to assist marine mammals in the event that they are affected by the debris? Is there monitoring being done uh, related to that? That's a good question. So there are existing you know, marine mammal stranding networks and other organizations that you know do um, that do look at and work with um, marine mammals and uh, entanglement issues. So and you know, those are still those are valuable very valuable efforts and very important efforts, um, both for, you know, tsunami debris and just in general for all debris, because certainly, um, you know, we've seen marine mammals get caught in all sorts of, you know, line, um, crab pot line, uh, packing bands, you know, those sort of instances are, are uh, have happened and continue to happen. So um, that's a part of that, that ongoing effort of those training networks and those dis disentanglement training. So that's part, a key part of that effort. And also, from a marine debris perspective, a big part of it is keeping the stuff from getting the water in the first place. So, um, trying to work with with um, stakeholders to try to you know, reduce the amount of packing bands and fishing line and everything that goes into the water. So there's less out there for for species to get caught in. Well, very good, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. It's been an interesting presentation and fascinating responses to questions as well. Uh, we really appreciate your time and hope you have a busy summer. All right. Thanks very much. Yeah. So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap things up, folks. Uh, we have another poet uh, webinar scheduled for April, April 18th. That'll be at one o'clock Pacific time. And uh, the idea of that one, I guess it's actually going to be tying to uh, the, one of the, the uh, floating dock sections that Peter pointed out. Uh, we'll have Jessica Miller, who's an associate professor at Oregon State University, also working with the Coastal Oregon Marine Inter Experiment Station. And she's going to actually talk specifically about that dock that washed up in Oregon. So join us for that. It'll be April 18th at 1 p.m. Also, uh, look for an email that follows up uh, this uh, webinar. We have uh, both Peter's presentation and a recording of today's sessions available online uh, in the near future. So thank you all for attending and uh, ha have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>